Wait, remember Lilo and Stitch the series? Heck, I sure do. It's just another attempt from Disney to make their own version of Pokemon. In a loose way. The other time was with the Spectrobes video games. What perfect timing, because in a few days from this video coming out, I'm covering them over on my gaming channel. Jordan Fringe Gaming. Go on, give it a sub, don't be a jerk. But the show itself was a television series follow-up to the hit 2002 movie, Lilo and Stitch. From the success of the film and the booming franchise building it was doing, and was going to do, Disney would do what Disney does best and milk it as much as possible. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I am a big fan of Lilo and Stitch, and that goes for the expanded upon universe of spin-offs, side character storylines, and of course, the anime. Yeah, that's a real thing, and it's awesome. I also have this official Lilo and Stitch the series Cinemanga here, for some reason. Yeah, that's one way to make a book. Like I said, I am a fan. Taking place on one of the most beautiful locations on this planet, Hawaii. Specifically, the Hawaiian island of Kauai. We follow Lilo and Stitch on more adventures together, this time in pursuit of finding, capturing, and hopefully taming the rest of the 625 experiments that Jumba created. Stitch, if you didn't know, was the latest in the line of experiments, making him 626. We do go a few beyond 626, but we can talk about those later. Co-created by Disney animated film icons Chris Sanders and Dean Du Bois, the series first premiered on ABC September 20th, 2003, and didn't premiere on Disney Channel until a few weeks later on October 12th, 2003. The franchise was pretty planned out, so there was a nice flow of content from one platform to another as the years went by post the original movie's release date and accompanying success. The series was preceded by a pilot TV movie, and after its season 2 finale, flowed right into the next movie, Leroy and Stitch. And there was even a sequel movie titled Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch Has a Glitch, that was released in August of 2005, while the series was still running through its episodes. And it kind of ignores the canon of the show, but it could take place before the show, but we don't know. Or do we? I've come up with a few reasons why I believe the franchise is so cohesively successful. The flow between one project to the next really seemed organic from quality retention in the animation, to consistent voice acting, and all the way down to how each project was released. Quick note before we jump into the meat of this video, consider this your warning that this serves as a real-time video documentation of my descent into my final form as a Disney adult. That's how much I love this show. I, I'm kidding. Or am I? No, I'm kidding. My friend Scootish is a Disney adult, and he sometimes scares me. Stitch, the movie, serves as a pilot film to the series, so it's definitely a good idea to watch the movie beforehand as the show doesn't really give a ton of context by itself right off the bat. In the movie, we are introduced to our main villain, Dr. Jacques von Hamsterveel, Jumba's ex-lab partner who is seeking to acquire the rest of Jumba's experiments so that he can use them as weapons in his evil plans of, I don't know, the world domination, most likely. It's revealed that Jumba has been concealing a large container with little dehydrated pods that are a convenient storage method for all 600 plus other experiments. Once these little egg things touch the water, each artificial alien comes out of their hibernation. In the events of the final fight of the movie, the container is spilled, scattering the small pellets all across the Hawaiian island of Kauai, thus setting up the following series. The film offers a fun look into the purpose, goals, themes, and adventures that would be explored next, serving as a fun interlude to bridge the first movie to the new series. Lilo and Stitch, the series, is basically damage control for from the past movie. Each episode usually centers around one unique experiment being hydrated, each one being different and more unique from the last. The group must capture each one and teach it the concept of Ohana so that they can find it a good home where it fits in and can use its unique talents for the good of the community, rather than, you know, wreaking havoc across the island. That main plot point which carried over from Stitch finding his place in the original movie just warms my heart to see the good-hearted nature of what makes the original such a favorite Disney film of mine still being at the the center of the show. The focus in the majority of the series is finding, capturing, and assimilating the experiments into society. But we do get a lot of variety further into the series where we see the experiments being used as a tool for the plot in itself, when and where their unique talents are needed. We also get a spout of seemingly random and not spread out crossover episodes with the likes of American Dragon Jake Long, Kim Possible, Recess, and The Proud Family. I will touch on those separately in a little bit, but seeing crossovers in cartoons as a kid was always such a cool thing 
thing to me and I can never shut up about it when stuff like this happens. Each one of the experiments is unique and had a lot of thought put into them which is also an immense feat considering how many we were introduced to in this semi-conventional slash unconventional experiment of the week format. We had number 606 that makes black holes, number 177 that eats hair, number 303 can induce amnesia. What was I saying? Oh, and my personal favorite, number 520. This one has a back end so big he can create a tsunami that could wipe out the planet. But one of the most prominent is Experiment 625, or later renamed as Ruben. He is a main side character that easily won over viewers with his charm, with a speaking role voiced by veteran voice actor Rob Paulson. He plays a larger role in the overarching plot and we frequently visit him when he and Gantu interact. As the experiment right before Stitch, he possesses all of Stitch's powers and abilities, plus advanced lingual talents, but because of his extremely lazy nature, he doesn't tend to use these powers and prefers to just, you know, chill and sit back, using his skills to perfect the art of sandwich making. Thus, why we got the classic computer game 625 Sandwich Stacker. Ah, those days were so much easier. Gantu himself gets a much larger role in the series, and we get to see him as the main villain of this series, but like, a fun villain. After he loses his job and is humiliated by Stitch, it makes sense that he would turn to Dr. Hamsterveel in an attempt to both get his bag while getting back at Stitch and his family. But in the interactions we get in many of the episodes, Gantu is actually not very threatening at all, despite his very large and threatening appearance. He never feels like a true threat, and there are times where we get to see him and the rest of the crew kind of bond, like when they're stranded on an island together. A lot of the main forces that make him a villain is his boss's orders of capturing the experiments that frequently allow him to clash with Lilo and Stitch who are working to reform and rehouse those experiments. He never really seems to win in their little competition here, but it never really is a big deal because Dr. Hamsterveel is technically still just giving orders from a locked away cell and does not pose any sort of real threat to any of the characters, at least for now. <laughs> Hold on, cause Lilo and Stitch the series will be right back. Lilo and Stitch the series is back. The Pilecki house is just as crowded as we left it in the original movie, with Nani still working to support everyone. Jumba and Pleakley have moved into Lilo's original room, and Lilo and Stitch have moved into the really cool spherical tower that was added to the house at the end of the first movie. This new dynamic of everyone living together creates a found family dynamic that extends to Jumba and Pleakley that I wasn't really expecting to happen, but I actually love it a lot. I have talked about found family in so many videos as this theme and form of character storytelling means a lot to me. They coexist together with Jumba continuing to experiment and Pleakley just living, and learning more about Earth, culture, and expressing himself in so many different ways. Nani isn't around as much as her character was in the movie, but when she is, it's usually centered around her struggling to balance her work life with Lilo's demands. She does manage to find a few steady jobs, and thanks to Jumba and Pleakley, Lilo and Stitch are not really on their own when Nani's at work, making money to support Stitch's eating habits. We also get to dive deeper into Lilo's day-to-day -day personal life. We see more of her daily activities, how she keeps herself busy, and at some point we even witness her develop a crush uh, to this guy. And who knows why? Probably because he has a skateboard. That's why I have so many skateboards. It's for women to notice me. It hasn't worked yet. Maybe I just need more skateboards. Her peers are actually nastier to her in the series than the preceding movie, so we get to see the fun ways she retaliates. Myrtle is given a lot more screen time than I would have expected, but it makes sense in giving Lilo another human character her age to have a rivalry with, giving a nice break from always worrying about alien stuff. Myrtle even gets an episode centered around her new dog, who is actually an experiment, but it just looks like a dog. And nothing she ever does in the show is redeeming, so th that's annoying. Although Myrtle doesn't present any redeeming qualities at all, we do see how Lilo learns her lessons about her true relationship with her peers, and we start to see her turning the other cheek and see how her character shifts and matures over time. The series is more charming to watch than it is funny. The main few parts I found myself laughing at are in the charm of Lilo's character and her childish perspectives. She still retains a lot of the charm that she had in the original movie, and for the series with so many episodes, it's impressive how the writers managed to keep her loyal to the feral and opinionated little girl that we were introduced to in 2002. There's a lot of her quirks that carry over serving as callbacks to the original movie, and that makes the series feel that much more connected. Like her 
Elvis fixation, Pudge the Fish, and her sudden use of depression-fueled one-liners. Considering the sheer amount of content that Disney was pushing out for this show, it's also impressive how they managed to make the animation look as good as it does. It's a bit more rough than the original movie at times, but for a TV series adaptation, it does a really good job. The watercolor backgrounds are just as rich and immersive, which is iconic to the franchise. The animated characters in the foreground are not as smooth as they are in the movies, but overall for a series adaptation, it still looks great. Another reason that the flow of the franchise seems so seamless was the voice acting. Almost everyone was able to reprise their original roles. We had co-creator Chris Sanders voicing Stitch, and Davy Chase comes back as Lilo, and she still managed to sound the same through the years passing since the original movie, as she was going through her own teenage years in real life, post the first movie. Tia Carrera is still in the role of Nani, David Ogden Steers still as Jumba, Kevin McDonald retains his role of Pleakley, and Kevin Michael Richardson knocks it out of the park again as Captain Gantu. Our new characters add some much appreciated spice. Voice acting veteran Jeff Bennett takes up the evil mantle of Dr. Hamster Veal, and Rob Polson joins the team voicing the ever so indulgent experiment 625, or you know, uh, Ruben. I know I've mentioned that twice, but Rob Polson is one of my personal favorite voice actors in the business, and anytime I can mention him, I will. Also, for the longtime viewers of the channel, this one's just for you. He was also Carl Weezer. Jimmy, I have become Ultra Instinct Carl now. Llama Palooza will be mine. The only characters that didn't retain their voice actors were for Myrtle, now voiced by Liliana Mummy, and for David, he's now voiced by D. Bradley Baker. Overall, the cast is stacked with some incredible talent that continue to bring the world of Lilo and Stitch together. The final reason for the franchise's extra smooth flow was the dates and methods of which various episodes were released in the beginning of the series. The franchise has its fair share of gaming content. The number of Flash games are in the dozens, many of which are relevant to the plot of the series and not just the original or second movie. Early episodes of the series could actually be found as features on Lilo and Stitch games. Episodes Slushy and Poxy were both put out separately within Disney's collections of Game Boy Advance video releases. And episodes Clip and Mr. Stenchy were featured in the 2003 DVD game called Lilo and Stitch's Island of Adventure. Lastly, the follow-up movie Leroy and Stitch contained a bonus feature that was the last episode of the series titled Link, before that episode would officially air on television. Jumping from one project made sure that there was no downtime in transition periods and often rewarded the fans with early peaks or extra bonuses for staying on top of the new releases. This can be attributed to a solid forethought plan of where they wanted to take the series and tell these stories, as well as Disney both seeing the success of the property and allowing the creative team the time, space, and money to do so. Also to touch on the Leroy and Stitch thing, that film can be counted as the wrap up to the series in general, having a showcase of all the experiences experiments in action going against a cloned army of Leroy, who is Experiment 629, which is basically Stitch, but with more speed and strength, which is funny because there's another two experiments past Stitch and before Leroy, like 627, which is again, just like Stitch, but pure evil. There is a 628, but all we know about this experiment is that it's locked away still as a pod, so who knows what that pod holds inside. Don't panic! Repeat! Do not panic! Ohana means family. Lilo and Stitch the series will be right back on Disney Channel. They're BFFs and they are back. Lilo and Stitch the series on Disney Channel. The criticism from fans of the series is pretty far and few between. The main point of contention is that the series doesn't feel nearly as emotionally driven compared to the movie. And I agree that the tone isn't as heavy, but it also makes sense that it wouldn't be. The reasons for the heavier emotions in the original film were because there was a lot of trauma between Nani and Lilo that needed to be dealt with, and a point of the movie was to deal with it. And they did. Compared to the movie, it's hard to find anything that would be as emotionally heavy, and although it doesn't feel as weighty, there are still important issues that are tackled and nothing is ignored for the sake of making the tone just a bit lighter. Which is why I mentioned earlier why I love the found family aspect. But also, it's a TV show that serves the main purpose of providing additional content for people who enjoyed the movie. Which heck, I always appreciate. I would hope that they would save the emotionally taxing parts more so for the movies because pacing wise for a TV show like this, it would be exhausting and redundant to constantly revisit. Thus shifting and focusing the emotion to 
into these experiments rather than Lilo and Nani, it just makes sense. And for the show in general, I thought it was a fun and clever way of extending the canon of the universe that was established in the movie, with the original creating such a vivid and culturally rich atmosphere and characters that I grew emotionally attached to. Getting extra fun content where I get to see them running around in their everyday lives, exploring more of the town, beaches, and the people is such a blessing. Being able to retain both original co-creators of the movie, as well as the voice actors, already sets a precedent of familiarity that is so visceral and tangible. I can feel the love and respect for these characters in every line that is written and recorded. This is why I love not just the movie, but the world of Lilo and Stitch. It's such a comfortable and easy show to put on and return to at any time. And considering it reached the milestone of 65 episodes, there is a decent amount of content here. Another positive is that there was an overarching plan for more content after the series ended, so it never felt like there was anything left unsaid or any plot points ignored. It also spawned some other interesting iterations around the world, which we will discuss in just a moment. Disney, however, saw the popularity and wanted to capitalize on it along with the other shows that it had on the network. There are four main crossover moments that the show had, bringing in Kim Possible characters like Kim, Ron, Rufus, Wade, Shigo, and Draken, where Rufus gets mistaken for Experiment 607, leading to a bunch of fun shenanigans and Kim learning to dance the hula. A fun episode for sure, but one that truly doesn't have a reason for happening other than to just make it happen. The show Recess, oddly enough, had a crossover as well, where the kids all go to Hawaii so Gretchen can better observe a new planet, or so she thinks. Through trying to capture Experiment 285, they end up working together to stop him from zapping others into a very chill and lazy state. It's not a very eventful crossover event, but hey, 285 now helps de-stress tourists at the airport, so there's that. The Proud family also makes their way over to Hawaii, where Experiment 397 is released. And yeah, it was in Sugar Mama's bathtub. But the power that this experiment holds is to cause a fight between creatures and or individuals. At one point, having Lilo and Penny trying to duke it out, all the while Penny is trying to write her school article which would be about her Hawaiian alien adventure. This episode surprisingly felt more purposeful for a crossover. In a weird way, it just worked really nicely and I really enjoyed it. The last crossover was with American Dragon Jake Long, which features a skateboarding competition that Lilo enters to help win Kione a new skateboard. While he was away and he can't compete himself. Jake Long and the bunch come over to the island first and foremost for magical creatures that they think people are reporting seeing here. But it's just aliens, so it's all good. Also, there's a cool skateboarding competition. Well, why not be a part of that, right? Overall, a solid entry for the crossovers that felt like there was a reason for it to make sense. But just because that was all of the crossovers in the show, that doesn't mean we've seen some other forms of crossovers for Lilo and Stitch. In the Leroy and Stitch movie, we can spot Timon and Pumbaa in the background among the scattered experiments, as well as we can see Stitch make an appearance in the fake bloopers made for the Disney film Brother Bear. So that made for a fun surprise. Oh, and we cannot forget in The Lion King one and a half when a bunch of Disney characters, including Stitch, join in on the commentary of that film. Or all of the promotion Disney did before Lilo and Stitch the movie came out, where Stitch would ruin the moment in several classic Disney films. Stitch somehow made his way everywhere, and he even went global. After the finale of the series, Disney went on to actually make two more TV shows in the franchise. One Japanese series called Stitch that had an impressive run of three seasons with 83 episodes actually surpassing Lilo and Stitch the series in terms of runtime, and a Chinese series called Stitch and I, sporting a very humble 13 episodes. These shows were, at the core, the same experience but told through slightly different animation and main characters, aside from Stitch. For the show Stitch, we have Yuna, now replacing Lilo. And for Stitch and I, we have Wang Ai Ling. Stitch is the more accessible to watch spinoff that literally all happens because there's a misunderstanding between Lilo and Stitch, which lands him on a fictional Japanese island to go on adventures with a new person named Yuna. And we even get to meet Experiment Zero, named Cyber, who, well, is basically just evil, kind of robotic Stitch. We do get to see how long time has passed, as in one episode we see Stitch reunite with Lilo, except that's not Lilo. 
that's Lilo's daughter who looks just like her for some reason, and this is Lilo, now all grown up. How long was this misunderstanding going on for? I feel it could have all been resolved quite some time ago. This was all a crazy ride for sure, but when, if ever, will we see Lilo and Stitch return again? Well, it may be sooner than you think. There's been a lot of buzz about a potential live action remake of the original 2002 movie. Rumored to be released as early as 2024, currently it is set to be directed by Dean Fleischer Camp. Known for his recent work on the A24 movie, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, but this could change as the directing position has been sort of unsteady. With it shifting recently to Fleischer Camp from Justin Bieber, Never Say Never, and Crazy Rich Asians director John M. Chu, because he has his hands full working on a Wicked project. And I know a lot of fans are naturally weary of any Disney live action remake, but hey, the more content, the better sometimes, I guess, maybe? I don't know, I, sometimes I'm very indifferent about this. I understand that just as it has the potential to be amazing, it also has the potential to be a huge disappointment. I am more hopeful as I am such a big fan of the property, but that also makes me equally as nervous as to how Stitch will look in live action, or excuse me, CGI. I'm hoping it looks somewhat more like this Sonic rather than this Sonic, but only time will tell. And in my opinion, the art of animation was the best mode for telling the story that we were given in 2002. But I guess we won't know how it translates into live action unless they try it. And it was only a matter of time anyway until they did. You can't stop them, they're gonna do it. My only fear with this is that if it performs poorly in reviews, ratings, and at the box office, it may deter Disney from exploring any further Lilo and Stitch concepts in the future. But maybe what we have already has just been the perfect amount. So I guess we'll just have to put our faith in the godfather of Marcel the Shell and hope for the best. I mean, just look at how cute Marcel is. Let's hope Stitch can come out looking something in this realm of cuteness. But are you excited for the future of Lilo and Stitch? Uh, whether it's a yes or a no, let me know in the comments as well as your thoughts on Lilo and Stitch the series in general. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this, or I'll replace your mayonnaise with vanilla pudding. Click the join button to become a member and support the channel. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.